Welcome to Not Two Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. The Marxist Theory of Art by A. V. Lunacharsky. We are excited to provide to our readers the first English translation of Essays on the Marxist Theory of Art, compiled by the Association of Artists of Revolutionary Russia, AKHRR, and published in 1926. The current volume contains a selection of articles on the Marxist perspective of art and culture written by Anatoly Vasilyevich Lunacharsky, Soviet writer, journalist, educator, and philosopher, early member of the Bolshevik Party, and longtime comrade of Lenin and Stalin. Despite his brief errors in siding with the imperial criticism of Bogdanov, Lunacharsky was able to correct this error and played a great role in the development of early Soviet culture and education, through his participation in the AKHRR and as the first People's Commissar for Education. As a communist leader, Lunacharsky ardently upheld Marxism and the thought of Lenin, then referred to as Bolshevism, and was among one of the first people to apply it to the field of art and culture in a systematic and conscious manner, using class analysis to examine the class nature of art and its characteristics. When the newborn Soviet state was facing ideological confusion on the question of culture and propaganda, he correctly pointed out that there is no pure art, or art for art's sake, as all art and culture are class-based and have their origin in class struggle. In his own words, quote, the most effective way to research art pieces is by conducting class analysis, end quote. Today, as more people become attracted to progressive, democratic, and revolutionary ideas, we believe it would be of assistance to republish this book at the service of the study of proletarian culture and art. Essays on the Marxist Theory of Art is a collection of five articles by Lunacharsky dated from the late 1910s to early 1920s, and contain almost the entirety of his earlier book, Fundamentals of Positive Aesthetics, although rearranged by the AKHRR to better serve political and educational purposes. The contents of the current edition are mostly based on the 1926 Chinese version titled Theory of Art, translated by Lu Xun who decided to include the second chapter of Fundamentals as an appendix, the only chapter not included in this volume. The 1926 Russian edition included the introduction and first section of the article Wilhelm Hausenstein, omitted by Lu Xun, which we also included. As the original Russian edition is not accessible to us, chapters 2 to 5 were translated directly from the collected works of Lunacharsky, volumes 7 to 8, while the preface to the 1926 edition and chapter 1 were translated from both the Chinese translation of Lu Xun and the Japanese translation of Shomu Nobori. Due to our technical limitations, there might be many errors and insufficiencies, and we would greatly appreciate feedback from our readers. Germinal Publications Preface to the 1926 edition Today, we can perceive an increase in interest in general theoretical issues in all fields. The Soviet Union, which has put an end to the devastation of the World War and the legacy of the war with its compatriots, with a heroic effort that is rare in the world, is now developing its capabilities in the field of general culture. We have indeed seen the germination of a new art before ourselves the creators of the representatives of the new social group, the working class. Previously, they did not have the opportunity to move freely in the field of art, and only a few seedlings were able to show themselves easily on the ground. We know their names one by one. And about the dozens and hundreds of other geniuses who have been completely lost to the world, history keeps silent. In the emerging art, It is extremely difficult to discover oneself, to develop one's own destiny, and to realize one's actual life. 
It is especially difficult for our young people who are studying in various art schools and institutes. There were very few good works on art, and even fewer on scientific and socialist literature. Therefore, it was almost impossible to introduce any books to people who were new to the field of art, and to those who wanted answers to the questions of everyday life in general. From this demand, which is now clear, the Association of Revolutionary Russian Artists decided to publish Lunacharsky's book. This book is an organized compilation of several papers, which were written on various occasions and for various reasons, and which are united by a common title. But this is not a theory of aesthetics in the original sense. In these essays, the nature of interest, beauty perception, and beauty judgment are not dissected. The focus in this book is on art itself, and the process of its development. In particular, the process of artistic creation is dissected in detail. Here, it is clear what can be given to the class view of art, the artist who is aware of his own attributes toward the proletariat. In compiling these essays, the publisher has made an effort not only to present Lunacharsky as a theoretician of scientific socialist art, but also as a practical guide. We can clearly see in many of Lunacharsky's writings on aesthetics in general the attempt to conscientize the creation of art in that process. When Lunacharsky speaks of the method of form, and when he speaks of the value of the content of art, the reader will see everywhere, before himself, not only a single scholar of art of various schools, but also a practical guide of certain tendencies. The crystallization of this complete experience of living art is what makes this book valuable and meaningful. The contents of this book will grow organically if the components are dissected. That part of the book deals with the subject of art and life with extraordinary certainty. So far, the abstract, constrained, inanimate, formal art, which by all means has been asserting its existence, is now tired of all people. Now, it is the slogan, Art for the Masses, that is particularly appealing to our artistic youth. In fact, the more art is able to express modern life in a real and modern way, the more complete and meaningful art will become. Therefore, there is no need to fear that art will become a slave to reality and imitate it. In this connection, we will find in this book brilliant pages on the theme of life and ideal. We should follow this slogan everywhere. Association of Artists of Revolutionary Russia Moscow, 1926 Art and Marxism In the literature of scientific socialism from Marx onwards to modern times, there are still relatively few specialized works devoted to the question of art. If there are, they are only limited in the number of pages devoted to it. Yet the existence of the principle of a purely scientific and socialist attitude toward art is an undeniable fact. Let us now briefly try to summarize that fundamental principle here. First of all, according to scientific socialism, which is the theory of the development of human society, art is a certain superstructure on the relations of production, which determines the forms of labor that govern the era. Art can be a superstructure for this economic base in two relations. First, as an industry, i.e., as part of production itself, and second, as a conceptual form. In fact, from barbaric times to the present, Art has played a prominent role in the life of all mankind as a certain tendency of human life. Therefore, it is not easy to find the forms, colors, and other elements in all the products of human labor which are intended only from adaptability. For example, whether it is a building or a book, an apparatus or a street lamp post, take any convenient thing and see what determines the fundamental proportion. In this, we know that the proportionality is not intended from the convenience of the use of those things, just as the method of Fechner's measurement shows. If it were only a matter of convenience, 
then there could be longer and wider things. Then the parts would have been in a different proportion. But to change the proportion, if it is not made too unsuitable, is to cause an unpleasant impulse. On the contrary, a proper proportion has nothing to do with any other idea of interest, but gives a pure pleasure. I have deliberately quoted the simplest example, but like this, it can also be asserted that there is no such thing as a work made by hand without traces of decorative desires, such as polished surfaces, glazed surfaces, various patterns, some strong coloring and certain color coordination, etc. This is to know that human beings are born with this strong tendency, that is, on the one hand, to make the raw product, but on the other hand, not only pursuing the purely utilitarian purpose, but also to achieve that artistic purpose. And this artistic purpose is to beautify the thing, so that it is appropriate to our sensory organs. Everyone knows that there is a fast sound and a fast color. From such a simple analogy, one strives to make the result of creation a pleasant, perceptible, agreeable, and interesting thing. It is only natural that such interest in things should vary greatly from nation to nation and from age to age. In this relationship, to study the fundamentals of each style, it should be extremely interesting. For example, the Chinese works of art are very good and beautiful, but the ancient Greek works of art are fundamentally different. Another example is French furniture, which is the root of the interest of the whole of Europe. What is the reason for the changes in each era? For example, from luxuriousness of Louis XIV to the flamboyance of Louis XV, from then on to the solidity and rigor of Louis XVI, to the neatness and dullness of the style of the revolutionary era, and then to the pure and majestic harmony of the Napoleonic style. However, there is no other way than scientific socialism to elucidate the real causes of the countless changes in style. But in order to do so, scientific socialism should be based not only on a definite knowledge of the social organization of the time, of the traditions of previous generations, but also on a refined knowledge of the materials, production machinery, and other purely technical elements used by a people in a time. But art is not only a special kind of industry, nor is it a special function that enters into almost any production, but art is also a conceptual form. What is the conceptual form from the viewpoint of scientific socialism? It is a reflection of the system of human consciousness, something that fills the life of human consciousness. Naturally, the consciousness of human beings is also made up of some personal, so-called momentary and fragmentary thoughts and feelings. However, once these thoughts and feelings are crystallized, they acquire the nature of conceptual forms. Before scientific socialism, or alongside scientific socialism, most sociological schools thought that the self-organization of thoughts and feelings was an independent process, and even regarded this idealistic process as fundamental. Moreover, many sociologists thought that human society, which had organized its own thoughts and feelings by the power of sociologists and thinkers and artists, was striving to organize its own life and its surroundings according to the plans that had been devised from doctrine. Scientific socialism, however, proves that there is no such thing in practice. According to scientific socialism, the conceptual form is developed by the real society, and therefore it takes on the characteristics of this real society. This means not only that the conceptual form receives the only possible material from the real society, but that the actual form of the real society governs the ideas organized in it, or the intuition of the conceptualizer, in the sense that the conceptualizer cannot be separated from a certain social taste, and that the conceptual form is also the product of the real society. Therefore, the conceptualist often has a certain inclination. He tries to organize the material with a certain purpose. According to scientific socialism, however, society is divided into several opposing classes. Classes are groups of people who occupy different positions in the production process, and therefore have different stakes. 
For example, the landowning class, the proletariat, the peasant class, the labor class, and so on. Naturally, when scientific socialism explains the class character of conceptual forms, it is not sufficient for scientific socialism to affirm that the conceptual forms are related to various major classes, such as the dominant class or the class struggling for its dominance, or the dominated class. No, the anatomy of scientific socialism goes even deeper. Scientific socialism requires the establishment of various jurisprudence, philosophical systems, religious doctrines, artistic schools, and relations with certain intra-class groups, or middle-class groups. Society is often very complex in that composition. Therefore, it is a sin against pure scientific socialism to include the phenomena of conceptual forms too simply in one basic class or classes, and it is a crude scientific socialism. The history of conceptual forms is based entirely on the history of sociality. Just as human society itself, in its evolution, is diverse and complex, so are conceptual forms. What should be added here is that while the dominance of conceptions is denied in relation to social evolution, the value of these conceptions is not denied by scientific socialism. The class does not waste its energy when it creates its own laws, its own religion, its own philosophy, its own morality, its own art. All this is not a mere reflection of reality in a diverse mirror. It is a reflection that becomes its own thing, or a social force, a banner, a slogan. And with these as the center, a class gathers together, and with the help of these, the class strikes at its own enemies, and from them collects its own persuaded members. Among other conceptual forms, art plays an excellent role. To a certain degree, art is the organization of social thought. Art is a special form of reality recognition. Reality can be known with the help of science. Science, on the other hand, strives for accuracy and objectivity. Scientific knowledge, however, is abstract and directed to human emotions, but it is nothing. However, the natural knowledge, the understanding of the phenomena, does not only mean to have a purely intellectual and systematic judgment of the phenomena, but also to establish a certain emotional, i.e. a warm, moral, and beautiful relationship with the phenomena. For example, when one understands the Russian peasantry, the one who understands it on the basis of statistical research is completely different from the one who understands it from the works of Uspensky and other writers of popular sentiment. Naturally, just as the statistical knowledge of the same peasant class can be deliberately or unconsciously destroyed, so artistic expression can become subjective, consciously or unconsciously. To put it more appropriately, it can become something that reflects the interests of the class, of which the artist is the exponent. This, however, is what gives art its power. Art is not only an organ of knowledge that is, not only a living and direct organ of knowledge of the reality of society, but also an organ of propaganda of a certain opinion, that is, of a certain attitude of the artist as mentioned above. That is, of a certain attitude of the artist towards the reality of society. But when art appears as an organ of thought, as mentioned above, it can also be said that it must be an organ of thought and feeling in one place. Sometimes, art can also be a full organizer of feelings. For example, music or architecture, not as technology, but architecture as art, cannot express any thought. It would take a great deal of effort to translate the words of music and architecture into our words, which express the concept or concepts. But nevertheless, the influence of music and architecture is great. The element of music and the element of architecture at this time, architecture and music are extremely close, can be said to be present in any art. If the sculpture is monumental and astonishes us with its balance, it does not come from the content of the sculpture, but from the subject matter. In particular, it comes from the style that unites the sculpture and the architecture. If the sculpture is elegant in its body, beautiful in its lines, and in the appearance given by the sculptor, there is a restlessness that makes us float, then we can say that the sculpture is full of music. 
Whatever the occasion, we are already in the sphere of the organization of feelings, of the organization of unconscious things. This, of course, can also be applied to a greater extent to painting. The composition of a painting, when it is done correctly and well, makes the painting almost like architecture. And the vividness of the colors of the painting makes painting almost like music. In literature, the same is true. The general composition of a great work of art, Dante's Divine Comedy, for example, gives the impression of a great gamelan. The rhythm, rhyme, and contrast, on the other hand, are every bit as much a part of literature as the outer musicality of the inner music. And this is combined with a subtle meaning of symbols that cannot be translated into purely critical language. When the question is about the organization of thought, it is easy to relate it directly to conceptual forms, and to the facts of life that produce them, or to the social groups that hold them. On the contrary, it is extremely difficult when the question touches on the organization of feelings, which is the most characteristic quality of art. That is why the history and theory of art have, until today, avoided scientific socialism in a very subtle way. But recently, a wide gap has been opened in this relation. The writings of Hoss Einstein, a German scientific socialist, historian, and theorist of art, for example, are a remarkable step forward. That is, the study of this subtle aspect of scientific socialism has been completed by him. The principles of scientific socialism as a theory of human society and its evolution are as above. Scientific socialism, however, does not only represent such a theory. Scientific socialism is also a certain program. Scientific socialism is the conceptual form of its own class, the proletariat, and it is the only conceptual form that does not destroy reality. This is proved by the fact that the proletariat is the class of the future, and by the fact that the science which states the reality as it is the strong combination of science which expresses the true tendency of the future is beneficial to the proletariat. In the same way, the tendency of the proletariat itself is also beneficial for all mankind. The proletariat, the last of the oppressed classes, liberates itself on the one hand and liberates all mankind in general from the class system on the other. There is no more significant and liberating reform than the reform caused by the proletariat. Therefore, the tendency of the proletariat is, at the same time, the tendency of all mankind. The proletarian theorists should not only describe with true objectivity how the flowers and fruits of art grow up on the social ground, but also have the full right to approach art critically. The same applies to the past. The theorists of the proletariat can criticize the works of art that are clearly harmful with the spirit of exploitation of human beings in the past. They can criticize works that express the passive suffering of the people or the obedience of slaves. They can also accuse art that is full of inertia, cunning, flattery, and doubt. This kind of art, in order to escape from the reality of society and its responsibility for it, deliberately retreats from all living content to empty intellectual games or sky-high dreams. But the proletariat, at the same time, and sometimes in the past, has been able to discover some kind of art belonging to the dominant class. These are rich in the spirit of extensive organizing and planning, full of the certainty of human power, the desire for light, and the longing for real life. Otherwise, they are works of art with a fundamental tendency to rebel against the arbitrary fate of the outside world and to declare the rights of a part of human society that has been ravaged. The voices, cries, laughter, and songs that sounded in the artworks of the past are as diverse as they are infinite. Each of these works of art, which have been dissected to the end, can be given a certain social evaluation. The works of art, in various senses, are the voices of people who are the proponents or pioneers of the proletariat, and they become something intimate and close in the proletariat. These works, though dubious from the point of view of the fundamental tendency, are interesting as something that exposes a special social phenomenon. 
or it is something that can be disliked and hated. However, at this time, we always return to the scope of the evaluation of the content, no matter what. The proletarian theorist, however, is also capable of evaluating artistic forms. For example, scientific socialism teaches us, without error, that the class that is interested in promoting new ideas and organizing big feelings must have a sense of the art of content and produce it. Contrary to this, the class that has no conceptual form and does not want to defend its rights, and whose shadow is thin, aspires to a purely formal art. And in this way, they make life a little more comfortable, so that they can live in it. In the realm of formal art, it is easy to practice all kinds of decadence, and there can be all kinds of beauty and debauchery. For example, the frivolous and flamboyant beauty, the aristocrats' obscene elegancy, are all such examples. The content of the thoughts and emotions of a class can be found, sometimes, in proportion to the form of expression. This is precisely the same as the heyday of the class. At that time, art became a thing of peace because of this unity of content and form. The artist is convinced that his work is important, and that it will be accommodated by a certain part of the same nation. At the same time, he was also sure that there was a form that could transmit this content to society. At that time, the so-called classical age came. However, before the classical age came, there should be an age when thoughts and feelings were not fully realized. Because such an age was in line with the rise of a class or a regime, and because this class at the same time strove to discover political forms for the benefit of its own class, such an age was abrupt and sloppy. The forms were unsettling. The artist, while straining his imagination, is groping to capture the forms he has not yet been able to capture. The thought that guides him is also still somewhat indistinct, only the feelings which are intense. This is where the thing called artistic romantic agency comes from. In the end, when the class passed through its heyday, the class was no longer necessary in society, and for him, new forces advanced. So he lost his self-confidence, lost his ideals, and his feelings crumbled like dust, changing from a dense team to a gravel of individualism. At that time, this was also reflected in art, where thought and feeling, which are the spirit of art, shrank and were soon dispersed. All that remained was a cold, formal technique that had degenerated into Yakutimism. However, it is not long before we look at the dead body of beauty ourselves. In a short time, the corpse begins to disintegrate, and the artist begins to take a reckless attitude towards form. That is, they try to be strange, or to exaggerate one side of their art. At this point, we are confronted with decadent art. Here, however, I have shown the main guiding principle that guides us scientific socialists when evaluating the art of the past. Here, I should also say that the most useful results can be obtained from the most negative works of art, if they are dissected in detail. First, as long as these works are signs of a social phenomenon, they will help us in our historical understanding. Secondly, these works of art contain various positive aspects. In decadent artwork, we can find a surprisingly beautiful combination of color, line, and sound. In the disintegration of art, the anatomical artist is able to find something of great technical value. There are many examples of this. We can find astonishing balance and greatness in the huge buildings built by a tyrant and dominated by the spirit of slavery. These qualities were added from the side of tyranny which in turn made it one of the widespread forms of domination organized by the masses. So the scientific socialist can learn for himself and teach others by the example of almost all the works of art of the past. But if, in this way, scientific socialism is not only a way of knowing the true roots of art, but also a way of art criticism and a way of using art, that is, a way of justly enjoying art and justly understanding art for its future development, then it goes without saying that the relationship between scientific socialism and the modern spirit is a particularly painful one. 
In this case, all the criteria of criticism shown above can be fully applied. The scientific socialist, as a reader and as a critic, is able to dissect each new work in the alarming research laboratory and to indicate its social foundation and social tendencies. He is also able to indicate its negative and positive aspects, as long as the content and form of the work are indicated. Scientific socialist writers, and even artists, can create that work while finding serious pillars in the theory of their own class. They can hold on to guiding principles and are free from all kinds of errors. And they can criticize themselves, while at the same time expressing all that their own class is asking them to express. Art and Industry There was a time when refined artists regarded industry as their chief enemy. One has only to think of Morris's magnificent utopia, the news from nowhere, whose very basis was the elimination of all machine industry from the coming socialist society and its replacement by manual labor. Think also of Ruskin, who not so long ago was the spiritual king of many an aesthetically minded European, including Russians. For one of the foundations of Ruskinism was his radical aversion to factories and railroads as elements that spoil the landscape, to factory products as poisons that poison everyday life with their stamped goods. If we reread the arguments of the various aesthetic enemies of industry and ponder them, we see that there is some truth in them. The least true, of course, is that plants and factories, railroad bridges and moving trains along with rail lines, all kinds of tunnels and viaducts have spoiled the European landscape. There is no doubt that there is a great mistake. The aesthete eye of earlier generations was not accustomed to all this. It seemed to him rude, dirty, utilitarian, artificial, and therefore condemnable. Indeed, the ancient world, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, even the 17th and 18th centuries, and their buildings along the lines of nature, did not violate the harmony and somehow more reckoned with the conditions of the landscape. But really, what business is it of the landscape for a builder of a large factory with several chimneys rising to the sky in order to fill its blue with clouds of black smoke? What business is it of the landscape to an engineer solving the question of how to connect two points by the shortest railroad line? However, far from pursuing the goal of beautifying the landscape, and devoid of any kind of aesthetics, the engineers, the builders of railways and large industrial enterprises, did not spoil the landscape at all. We have a different attitude now. Fire-breathing factories don't seem ugly to us. In the factory chimneys, we see more and more a kind of beauty. The railroad, not only because we live its life, moving along it with extraordinary speed, but because it has become an element of the landscape has become dear to us in its own way. With interest and purely aesthetic inner motion, we look at the train rushing by in the distance, and we are ready to refer to many railway bridges as some kinds of masterpieces of construction art, as well as some railway stations. How many excellent descriptions of a railway junction we have already accumulated, descriptions that breathe beauty. Recently, I had the chance to read a wonderful page devoted to a purely railway landscape in Hermann's novel Kubinka. Of course, here, too, it is possible to pose some questions, which I will point out later, questions in the spirit of whether an engineer, a builder of railways and industrial plants, could not gradually take into account, to some extent, the requirements of the human eye as well. But more about that below. There's much more truth in what is said about factory production. Of course, the disgusting cheapness that has supplanted conscientious craft labor is an undeniable demotion of culture. Of course, the manufacturer, seeking to kill all competition in the market with cheapness, very often did not stop even before the deterioration of the product in terms of simply its goodness. If the design of any chintz, the shape of any plates, hats, etc., claimed any aesthetics, it was usually in the sense of pandering to the vulgarest tastes of the crowd. However, it is very difficult to say who indulged whom, whether the factory industry adapted to vulgar demand or, on the contrary, created this vulgar demand itself. 
look, for example, at the phenomenon of fashion. For here it is no longer a question of colonial peoples, who are sold cheap cotton, crudely painted in various colors. Nor is it a question of the worker or the peasant, who buys all kinds of disgusting rubbish for his interior, whatever he wants because it's cheap. No, who follows fashion is mostly the woman of the bourgeoisie, the representatives of rich and ostensibly aesthetically pleasing families. After all, a fashionable woman is, it would seem, a person who pays particular attention to her appearance. And meanwhile, what does the factory do with fashion? It molds it as it pleases. Big tailors and big manufacturers, conspiring with a small bunch of journalists and cocottes, lace up as they please, perhaps, the most meaningless form of the toilet. One product today, another tomorrow. They use this or that suede, that brocade, this or that fur, making it endlessly desirable for every bourgeois woman, making her pay three prices for it because, you see, it is the fashion. So they wear it is, one might say, a sacramental phrase in the mouths of a huge number of women. If so they wear it, then even if it is not appropriate, even if it is contrary to reason, as old Griboyedov said, all the same. A woman will certainly put on the appropriate toilet and pay tribute to the entrepreneurs who invented this fashion and put it into circulation. On this example, you can see in what way the taste of the factory degenerates. It succumbs to taste where it is not discriminating and where it is not at odds with cheapness, and it subjugates taste where the benefits of marketing require it. How can one deny that not only the apartments of workers and civil servants but also the apartments of the great majority of the bourgeoisie, are crammed with incredible junk on the aesthetic side, junk which is almost exclusively of factory production. But the conclusions that people like Morris and Ruskin draw from this are wrong. It is not that the machine industry necessarily and inevitably has to make such bad objects for sale. On the contrary, the machine industry, and its further development, has been able and in part has always been able, to produce very fine artistic things, either without any touch of the human hand, or with the final worksmanship of a master craftsman. Is it not characteristic that Ruskin, early in his career, regarded all photographic methods of reproduction as a continuous horror? That he regarded the supersession by heliogravier of manual engraving as a sign of profound barbarism, and that at the end of his life, in the face of the amazing perfection which Helio Gravier had reached before his death, he had to confess that new fields for peculiar art were opening up here. Industry, the essence of which is the easy and cheap reproduction of any number of copies of a certain thing, is breaking into areas where it seemed by no means possible. Not long ago, everyone scoffed at mechanical musical instruments. But now there is a menial musical machine that reproduces the performance of an author or a great virtuoso of a piece of music on an instrument with such colossal precision that it can be subjected to the finest scientific, physical, acoustical, or aesthetic analysis after the performer's death. And in the field of theater? Who could have imagined that it was even possible to reproduce an actor's acting other than by performing it, even if it was for the hundredth time? which seemed already something industrial. And now, the cinema is beginning to create a cinema in which an actor can play in front of a hundred thousand people after his death, and just as well as on the most successful night of his life, a cinema that is coupled for this purpose with an advanced phonograph. I do not, of course, consider it necessary to turn the great mute into a mediocre talker. It is a tremendous aesthetic mistake to impose the word on the screen but it is still necessary to make it so that we can capture for all eternity our great actors, our great orators with their figure, their voice, with their pathos, and this, of course, is the greatest conquest. And of course, from a formal point of view, it is the purest industry, since this artistic phenomenon can then be distributed in any quantity and extremely cheaply. Industry is a sorceress. And the question is whether this colossal popularization, this colossal cheapening, which is attainable in the ways of industry, is accompanied necessarily by vulgarization, deterioration, and decline. 
Yes, this is true, because industry serves the capitalist. A capitalist only improves the quality of his product, especially the artistic quality, if he knows that this improves his own profits. This, however, is not always the case. Often, a cheap thing with poor quality is more profitable for him than a good but more expensive one. Although there are also the opposite cases, when the manufacturer has to let in extremely expensive and extremely perfect things at an insanely high price, especially for the exploiters. The middle ground can only be a healthy product that takes into account a person's aesthetic needs. To reckon with people's aesthetic needs is not to imagine what their taste is now and to meet it, but it also means to form that taste. The artist who would consider it his duty to indulge the public's taste, even if it were cultural, is bad, and only the artist who strives to elevate the taste of his fellow citizens, on whom he has an aesthetic influence, is good. It is at this point that I pass to what I believe to be an extremely important idea, one that I in no way claim to be original, but which must be understood in all its simplicity, without excessive zeal, without the cartoonish exaggerations we have lately often stumbled upon. What is needed is an indissoluble alliance between industry and art. To set ourselves this task within the framework of bourgeois society is almost completely hopeless. It can only be discovered in individual cases. But to set oneself this task within communist society is absolutely necessary. I am, of course, well aware that in Russia, in our difficult moment of transition, only small results can be achieved in this respect. The least we can do is to take this Jericho of individual taste, the rupture between industry and art, with the shrill trumpet cries of phony constructivism. But something is being done in this direction, and what is being done must be strengthened. In what direction, exactly, should we direct our efforts? I will not now speak of the specific tasks in Russia. I shall now take the problem in its general outlines, as it faces not only us, but as it will also face Europe as we approach communism. First of all, I will return to the first problem. Industry is bursting into nature, into the landscape, and spoiling it. Is this true or not? Is it true that an old medieval castle, that some ruin, is poetic and beautiful, and that a new, rationally built factory, a new building, say, a giant steelwork, is necessarily ugly? This, of course, is absolutely wrong. One would have to be surrounded by all kinds of Passeist-type prejudices to assert such a claim. It is true that Tolstoy somewhat hostilely defined the very word poetic as one in which something outmoded is resurrected. This definition of poetic would probably please the anti-poetic flank of the futurists a great deal, but it is, of course, nonsense. Poetic means creative, and should be so understood. The more creative something is, the more poetic it is. But creativity can manifest itself in a purely utilitarian form. It is poetic even in this form. Even such a thing as the French great market of edibles is a very poetic thing, and under the hands of Zola, without losing anything in its stench, its ugliness, nevertheless produces a purely poetic impression, for in this market an enormous energy is concentrated, for in it one feels the giant pulse of the belly of Paris, one of the great centers of human culture, of human destiny. The ugliest factory, dirty, crowded with all sorts of garbage, with disproportionate lines, a failed factory from an architectural point of view, is nevertheless poetic if work is boiling on in it, if creativity is evident in it, if it is, say, an outpost of culture, thrust into some wasteland, where man greedily clings to the coal and ore masses lurking deep within the earth with this factory. But does this mean that industrial creativity cannot pay attention to its aesthetic side, to its form? Far be it for me to dress up industry. It does not need this at all. On the contrary, in many respects, it is completely independent of the architect and the artist, and has already achieved remarkable aesthetic results. What is required of an ocean-going steamer is enormous magnitude, lightness, speed, and supreme comfort. 
it is only natural that the task thus posed, having been solved quite satisfactorily by the present shipbuilding engineer, should lead to the aesthetic results of which Corbusier Saunier speaks. In his other articles, he speaks of the automobile, of the airplane, and draws attention to the graceful, simple solution of a whole series of problems of construction and proportion of parts, to which architects, who are in captivity to old forms, have not yet approached, and which, we may say, in a joking and incidental manner, so to speak, the engineers have achieved gracefully. But the engineer in all these cases was interested in the elegance of form. He wanted to build such a steamer, such a car, such an airplane, that would please the eye. And in big industry, does the engineer set himself such a goal? Sometimes, undoubtedly, yes. There is no doubt that the car itself is almost always a beauty. I've rarely seen clumsy machines, and if you go to a good museum and see how this or that machine develops, you'll almost always see something like the development of animal organisms. Take ichthyosaurs and mastodons. There's something clumsy, uncoordinated, unguessed at first. And then the further you go, the more the machine simultaneously acquires, unlike animal organisms, both magnitude and power and internal coherence and grace. The animal species became smaller and more perfect, while the machine becomes stronger and more perfect, but perfect beyond a shadow of a doubt. There are machines to fall in love with, and when one looks at them, one notices that it is not only the proportionality of the parts and the expediency of the movements that the machine produces with power and grace, but also a certain coquetry of the structural engineer. The combination of polished and painted surfaces, from time to time a very sparingly but expediently put ornament, extraordinary cleanliness around such a machine, some slab-lined floor, wide glass windows, letting in a lot of light. Remember, for example, large power plants, all this produces unspeakable aesthetic impression, which makes each of us recognize other similar steel iron beauty, with a full right to put itself above any living or bronze quadriga in the ancient taste. So, it would be very good if, further on, and not just in a school formal way, architectural and architectonically aesthetic elements were drawn into industry. The engineer should not only be a utilitarian, or rather, he should be a utilitarian all the way. He should say to himself, I want my dynamo to be extremely cheap, to be extremely productive, and to be beautiful. If such considerations enter into the constructions of every craftsman, into the construction of every grandiose factory pipe, if the engineer considers the expedient from the point of view of human taste, and not at all harmful from the point of view of utilitarianism, the proportionality of what he creates, then we will have an extra big step in the direction where industry and art are united into one. The same, of course, is true of products. The technician who creates the objects of marketing must be the artist who creates the objects of human consumption, who wants not just to consume, but to enjoy the thing he consumes. It is important that the food be not only nourishing, but also tasty but it is a thousand times more important that the useful object of everyday life be not only useful and expedient, but also joyful. Let us say this word, instead of the still seemingly mysterious word beautiful, elegant. There will be all sorts of arguments and accusations of aestheticism. Let us say joy. Dress should be joyful. Furniture should be joyful. Crockery should be joyful. Housing should be joyful. The painter-technician and the technician-artist, two siblings, will one day see to it that machine production does not belittle, but elevates the taste of the human mass, and the human mass, no longer a crowd, will become demanding in this respect. The technician-artist is the engineer who has passed the rational school of learning the needs of the human eye, the ear, and the methods that contribute to the satisfaction of those needs. The artist-technician is a man naturally gifted with loyal taste, creativity, and abilities, in the direction of joyfulness, who has again passed, first, the rational school of artistic skill, and, second, the technical school, for his work will enter as an assistant, will enter as an important collaborator in the production of each product. All this, in fact, is being done now in industry. 
but all this is being done casually, in a staple, in a tasteless way, all in need of a tremendous correction. But here, another question will come before us. Are there any laws of taste to be learned? What do you mean by that? Some passeist will ask me, Probably you want to say that such an artist must learn all styles, the orders of ancient construction, the style of all 18 Louis, etc., etc. But at the same time, the futurist will say to me gloatingly, Well, what is taste? Taste depends entirely on the variations of a given day. Is it possible to speak of laws of taste? It is a matter of individual creativity and the masses. God forbid one look for something stable, classical here. God forbid one freeze the eternal run of inventiveness, and most of all those Dada theorists who said, it is not important that the object be beautiful, that the object be clever, that the object be good, but that it be new, that it be unseen. Both, of course, are pure nonsense. We cannot say now that the science of art is mature, but it is clear that it gives rich sprouts on all sides. If you read a book such as Professor Cornelius' textbook, you will see how avidly the most serious part of Germany seeks these stable laws, in this case, vision. But the same can be applied to the phenomena of the acoustic. Music is even closer to the resolution of its principles in this. Music has, essentially speaking, a profound science of musical beauty. This science has only become somewhat stiff, and is now undergoing a peculiar struggle of innovation in it. But this innovation, while extending the limits of musical science, certainly remains true to those basic principles, which, perhaps somewhat narrowly but correctly, have been guessed by the gradually established musical theory. In the field of visual impressions, linear, planar, and colorful, we have a much smaller system, but it too is beginning to emerge. Man still has one nose, two eyes, two ears, and while he remains more or less unchanged physically, in this sense, he remains largely equal to himself mentally. The fundamentals of mathematical thinking, the fundamentals of logic, remain the same. And just as the form of the hairstyle does not essentially change the basic human type, so the fashionable vagaries do not change the basic in man. True, one can also see the ugliness. Such ugliness, resembling flattened skulls, enormous butts, or mangled miniature feet of various fanciful civilizations, etc., are false departures from some basic laws of the simple, the beautiful, the proportional, the expedient, the persuasive, the stable, the harmonious, and at the same time, the rich, the intense, which lies in the depth of every true masterpiece, which can only be eclipsed by time, and which then always emerges and takes its indestructible place in the treasury of humanity. 200 or 300 years after the masterpiece was born. There are objective laws of taste, and just as the objective laws of harmony and counterpoint permit boundless creativity, an infinite number of creative variations, and the fruitful evolution of their entire array, so exactly, of course, do the general laws of taste, the general laws of some special proportions, permit all kinds of freedom in their application. The gigantic artistic task which we will not solve, which we may only prepare for our sons, will consist precisely in finding simple, healthy, convincing principles of the joy of creation and applying them through the medium of gigantic power to an even grander machine industry than now, to the construction of life and living for our happy descendants.